Good evening. Welcome back to my house at, for our midweek pre-fuel and refuel. The Audubon clock over my shoulder here tells me that it's goose o'clock, which means that it's time for uh, coming to uh, for a reconnection between Sundays here on Facebook Live. Thanks so much for joining me, whether you're here with me at 7 o'clock on this Wednesday evening or whether you're catching it sometime after the fact. I'm glad that you've taken the time to stop by. We've been in a walk through the Bible for uh, about a month and a half now, and it's been a really interesting path from Genesis going forward. I just want to refresh for you where we've been and then pick up where we're going to uh, start with this coming weekend. So remember that this whole story starts in the beginning, with the beginning, Genesis. And we spent some time in those first chapters of Genesis 1 and 2 in the creation. And we saw God working on purpose to make the world just the way he wanted it to be. Everything was very good. Tov ma'od was the word that came along. And then after the creation, we know that on purpose we wrecked the place in something called the fall. And we learned about that in Genesis chapter 3. And not only did we hear about the fall and how the world got broken, we also heard a wonderful promise uh, that there would be a savior. It's an incredible promise that this savior, he would have his heel uh, bruised by the evil one, but the evil one would have his head crushed by it. And then moving forward, we get into a story about Noah, where the sinfulness of human beings became so intolerable to God that he resolved that he was going to bring an end to it all and on purpose destroy the creation that he loved so much. But he loved his people, us included, so much that he started with his nymphs. These are something that we've been remembering all along. His remnant, on the one hand, people that he spared so that his purposes might continue on the earth, as well as a covenant a promise that God has made. And he gave to Noah a covenant that he would never destroy the world again by water. What a great promise that is. And no matter how bad floods ever might get, no, God's not going to destroy the world that way. Uh, after we met Noah, we went and spent some time and became acquainted with a gentleman by the name of Abraham. Abraham became the father of many nations. That's literally what his name means. And he renewed and expanded that covenant with Abraham. And Abraham came from a very far away place and was even brought to a spot where he was to trust God so completely that he would even sacrifice his own son, the son of his old age, his beloved son Isaac. And there with that faith he went up to the top of Mount Moriah and just before he was to slay his son, God stopped him and said, I have a different plan. Your son doesn't need to die. But remember that promise, that first one earlier, that covenant that God said that he would spare the world and he would send a savior? Well, that savior was God's own son, Jesus, and we celebrate him week after week after week. God continued that history and showed himself to be a faithful and loving God. And we ended up after a fellow by the name of Joseph, remember him and his coat of many colors and the way that he rose to prominence in Egypt and became kind of the vice pharaoh of that great land. And they saved uh, all kinds of food for seven years so that they became the, uh, the shoprite of the ancient Near East. And everybody, including the brothers that had sold him into slavery once upon a time, came looking for food. Joseph said one of the most wonderful things down in Egypt. He said, you had purposed something for evil, but God had intended it for good. And then he said, come, I will show mercy to you and your little ones. And it's a really wonderful reminder that God doesn't just work on people. He works through people. And God in, engages uh, people in their gifts and in their positions, in their vocations, to be able to give out his blessings left and right. And he didn't stop that with Joseph. He continues that along with us. Well, 400 years go by, and eventually there became a pharaoh who wasn't so kind to God's people, Israel, who had migrated down to Egypt because the Eton was good. And this pharaoh decided to enslave God's people and to bitterly uh, torment them to the point where God's people were saying and complaining, let us go from here. 
they cried out to the Lord and the Lord heard. And so he raised up another fellow down there in Egypt, a fellow by the name of Moses. And Moses, one of the great first prophets of Israel, of God's people, God called him. And this is one of those first times that we see God say, I have a specific purpose for you. And that specific purpose that was communicated to Moses was that he was going to be the one that freed his people from Egypt and the bitter yoke of slavery. And he was going to approach Pharaoh and be the one that says, let my people go. You see, the story pivots away from plain old ordinary folk to working and talking among kings and very important people on this day after election day, this type of stuff might be in our mind and how there is a role for people of faith to be speaking to kings and to declare the will of God and to make sure that they understand that there is a higher authority even that they are. No matter who ultimately ascends to the higher office of this land, they too are accountable to God for everything. Well, Moses, uh, after some convincing, uh, did bring his bring the people of Israel's complaint to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh uh, was not inclined to let his slave labor go, and so God sent plagues. Remember those? How these were uh, direct affronts to the gods of Egypt. So there was a frog god. God sent them more frogs than they could deal with. There was a river god. God made the river turn to blood, and he did this nine times over until finally we came to the Passover. And I'll put us on pause there. Later on in the spring, when we get towards Easter, we'll be talking about the Passover. More on that when we get to the springtime. But on that Passover night, God sent the 10th plague. And this is the plague of the death of the firstborn. The firstborn male everything gave their life unless they had had the blood of that spotless lamb put over their doorposts. And God's people, Israel, having received that instruction, followed those instructions. And God saved them. And it bruised Pharaoh so deeply that he finally said, get out of here. I don't want you even here anymore. Off go God's people towards the Red Sea. Pharaoh thinks, what have I done? And so now he needs to go and get those people or at least not let them get away. And so... There they were at the shore of the Red Sea. God's people, Israel, pinned against the water and Pharaoh's army coming after it. And they complained to Moses, what are we going to do? Shouldn't we have just stayed in Egypt? And God spoke to Moses when Moses complained, said, what are you talking to me for? Tell the people to walk forward. And when they did, they walked through the Red Sea on dry land and got to the other side. And when they got there, Pharaoh's army had pursued them. And then God closed back in the Red Sea and the route of Egypt was complete and the freedom of God's people was complete. Ah, it was wonderful. That was the Exodus. They got out. But then for 40 years, they were wandering in the wilderness. And this was a very special and intimate time for God and his people, Israel. God led them by a pillar of cloud by day. Everywhere they were supposed to go, they followed the pillar of cloud. They walked by a pillar of fire by night. It was a divine flashlight for them. All they needed to do was follow and listen to him. And this was a wonderful time of God's providing for them. Even though they were out in the wilderness, they learned to worship him. They received his commandments. They understood what it meant to be his people and that he was their God. Moses led them after that time at Mount Sinai at the Ten Commandments all the way up to the Jordan River. Just across that river was the promised land, the place that God had promised to his people all those generations before. And he said, I'm going to give you this land. Unfortunately, that land was already occupied by people like the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites, and they needed to go. 
And just last weekend, we heard the story of how Joshua had assumed the command of the armies of Israel and all of the people of Israel and that the Lord had met with him and told him to be strong and courageous, to not be terrified or dismayed. Why? Because the Lord his God would be with him wherever he would go. And that's a promise that we want to hold on to as well and to put into practice those same things that we ought to be strong. We ought to be courageous about our faith. We don't need to be terrified to share it or dismayed when things don't go exactly the way we would imagine. God is with us. The Lord our God is with us wherever we go. And God demonstrated this in spectacular fashion when he gave that crazy battle plan to Joshua that he would march along with the priests and the Ark of the Covenant, the sign of God's presence with them, around the city of Jericho one time every day for six days. And then on the seventh day, they'd march around seven times. And on time number seven, they were to give a loud shout and the walls of Jericho would fall. No general today would have made a plan like that. But God made a plan like that, and Joshua followed it to the T. He listened to God's commands and put it into practice, and so did all of the people of Israel. And you know what happened? Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. It was an astounding thing. This story, the walk through the Bible, from here forward, we're going to skip a lot of time, but I'll give you a quick little Um, synopsis of it so that you don't miss the important stuff in between. God's people went from city to city, town to town, conquering and being able to enjoy the fat of the land and settling and becoming a resident people once again, back in the land that God had first promised. And the many, many people started to populate that, that promise that God made to Abraham, that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars of the sky, started to come true. And in that time, there were all kinds of border raids where enemies of Israel would come in. And there were also disputes among the people. The tribes didn't always get along. And so God allowed for a ruler to arise in Israel after Joshua passed away. And these were called the judges. You can read all about the judges and there are some really incredible ones in there. We have people like, you know, Samson and we have Gideon. And uh, these are really wonderful stories about how they again heard the word of the Lord and put it into practice. But the problem was this. As you read in the book of Judges, it says every man did what was right in his own eyes. And so there became, rather than a dependence on God, an independence from God, which is not his design. And this independence led to sin. And the biggest sin that they sinned was the sin of idolatry. There were plenty of others. But at this point in time, many of the false gods that were part of that land of Canaan started coming back. And Israel started to accommodate these false gods and add them into the worship of the people. And this just was not meant to be. Remember that first commandment that, God, that Moses received? I am the Lord your God. And you shall have how many other gods before me? None. And here they were adding to those gods. And this is one of those moments where that God named Baal pops up and Baal is one of the bad news stories in the Bible. The judges had their time, there were 12 of them, and after they had their time in the the limelight, Israel started looking for more power. And they wanted power concentrated at the top of Israel, and so they started praying to God to have a king. And God said, listen, I know from kings, you don't want a king. (laughs) And still they pleaded with them, don't we have the tendency to do the same thing? I don't know exactly what we need in providing for what we need, and yet we end up longing for something and praying for something. God might not yet deliver those things into us, but if our heart keeps on turning away from Him, sometimes He's not above giving us that thing that allows us to see how much of a dead end it really is. I'm reminded of a quote from George Washington. At least this is one of the reputed things that he said. He said, talk about I'm 
message, part of the way that we work together. Well, God gave them gifts, and the first one of them was the name of Saul. Saul was anointed shepherd the people of Israel. And Samuel did it. He became a prophet. And Samuel uh, what came to him, and he also spoke messages to people that God wanted to bring to them. So Saul, he was a fantastic man. At first, he was a very, very strong man. All about David, and if you want to be a uh, you know a real star and, and 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 read all the way through the books of First and Second Samuel, are the story of King David and his ascent to the throne. But let me read from First Samuel chapter sixteen. The Lord said to Samuel, "How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel?" Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Bethlehem, that place where Jesus was born. This matters. For I have provided for myself a king from among his sons. Not just the one that was going to be anointed now, but also a king that would be anointed later on. sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And so he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. And when they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't look on his appearance or on his height of stature, because I've rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. I'll say that again. Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, but I reject him. The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the appearance. Just called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Nope, the Lord is not doing this one. Then he made Shammah pass by. He said, Nope, neither the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all of your sons here? He said, The youngest, but behold, he's 
keep him shaved. And Samuel suggests he send and get him for we will not sit down until he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. And he had a place his hands to him. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of the oil and anointed him and his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So this is the first that we meet this shepherd, king, poet, sinner, David. If you follow it, you'll see that he was the, the little kid that could. He, he was very skilled with his shepherding. He was very skilled musically. He was very skilled in diplomacy. He was very skilled in everything that he did himself to. He did a superb job. Even in the really went above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, he committed adultery and murder. And who knows how many other sins along the way. What does this mean? People look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. The Lord knew all the things of which David was capable, the good and the bad, and the very real. He still chose him. The Lord looked on his heart and didn't see a perfect heart. He looked on his heart and didn't see perfect intentions. He looked on his heart and saw a human being. And he chose him anyway. God does not need perfect people. And it's a good thing because there aren't any. This is a trustworthy saying we find in the New Testament. Christ Jesus died to save sinners, of whom I'm the foremost. That's how this works. There isn't a saint in the Bible who wasn't also a sinner in the Bible. And there isn't a saint for today who isn't also a sinner living today. God looks on the upward appearance. He's going to see what everybody else sees. He's going to see what goes wrong. But God doesn't care so much about the surface. He's looking for a heart that's oriented toward him, that seeks after him. How's your heart? Is your heart dismayed? We heard my words, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. How's your heart? Is it fearful? I can understand that. How's your heart? Is it worried about what's going on in society these days? How's your heart? The Lord's looking on it. And if your heart is looking for the Lord and finding him in the son of David, that promised Savior who would be anointed years and years later, just seeking him, the Lord is seeking you. The Lord comes and chooses us. We don't choose him. Jesus made that clear. And he chose us to go and bear fruit. We're going to see in David as we look at him this coming weekend. Right about him, we connect. We're going to see that he bore a lot of fruit. Fruit that lasts. There is a greater king in Israel than David. David gave himself to the Lord. And even when he was sinned and confronted, when he sinned and confronted it, he repented and turned himself back to the Lord and sought him with all of his heart. So, my dear friends, let the King David to us instruct us on things like friendship and worship and fellowship. Let's also 
let him instruct us on what to do when our heart puts its bony finger at us and says, you haven't done what the Lord has wanted you to do. Let's take up his way as well so that we can be found to be a man after God's own heart the way that King David was. That's my prayer for you. A couple of things before we say night. One is I'd love to see you in worship, although this weekend worship is full. <laughs> There's a lot of people that can be there because we're celebrating the right of confirmation. And one of the cool things about confirmation is the opportunity to talk about how they have the opportunity to, as trained youth uh, to seek the Lord with their whole heart as well and to receive the work of the Holy Spirit. The same one that rushed in on David, and he was with the Lord from that anointing forward. That same Holy Spirit is with them, too. So I would love it if you tune in and be with us on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. here on Facebook Live. But after the fact, it would be great as well. This weekend also is a congregational meeting. That congregational meeting is going to be taking place only online in Google Meet. You'll re receive the login information in Weekly Connect and it'll also be posted in the calendar event for the church so that you can come and join us at 1 p.m. this coming Sunday in that way. I hope to see you there for that. The other thing is that you should start to uh, think about uh, coming to a uh, uh, worship during the month of December. Uh, we're going to be celebrating Christmas kind of in an extended way. We'll tell you more about it in the weeks to come. But in the month of December, the registrations for worship, we're going to be asking people to register for only one week, one Sunday out of the month of December, so that the widest swath of the congregation has the opportunity to be in person for a Christmas-like experience during the season of Advent. Stay tuned for more information on that, but I just wanted to give you a heads up that that schedule is coming as well. With all those things said, I'd love it if you'd join me in a word of prayer so that we can close off our evening and prepare for what the Lord has in store for us tomorrow. The Lord be with you. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the blessings of this day, for leading us from the morning until the night, and for opening up your hand of blessing. We thank you for forgiving our sins, the many that we have committed this day, turn our hearts away from those sins and toward you. Father, look upon us as well and see the beauty of your work and appoint us, O Lord, according to your plan to bear fruit and to serve you in the ways similar to King David, to put our gifts to use, to praise you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to turn toward you in the day of joy and in the day of trouble. Lord, you did, did wonderful things for your people, and we pray that we might be blessed and permitted to do the same thing. Lord, keep on looking on our hearts, and where they are awry, bring them back. Keep on looking on our hearts, and where they are in good stead, confirm us. Father, thank you for the people of St. Paul's Lutheran Church wonderful people who have been gathered by you to share the love of Jesus. Please bless them in all their works and their ways and allow this little corner of your kingdom to be a place of beauty and strength where you are honored and your people are built up. Thank you, Lord, for all of the folks who have tuned in this evening and for all of those who aren't hearing this message. Please send your spirit to them to move in their hearts and minds to seek you so that you may be found in your word, in your sacraments, so that we may be able uh, to rejoice in your presence. We pray all of these things, thankfully, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Very clearly, God loves you very much. He loves you so much. Too. God loves you more. Um, rest well in that knowledge. We'll talk to you soon. Good night.